Our next talk is another result of this task force, and that's going to be given by Ben. Benjamin Eggleton is the director of the University of Sydney Nano Institute, and also a professor of physics at the University of Sydney. He was the general chair of CLIO in 2019, and he has a deep understanding of how CLIO works, the audience that comes here. And he has been part of the uh, CLIO Task Force on Diversity and Inclusion. And his commitment to DNI has been tremendously helpful for the task force. We've known each other for several years and having worked together on diversity and inclusion for the Australian optics community as well, in which Ben's leadership has played a critical role. His talk today will include an overview of his journey on diversity and inclusion and the clear benefits that a diverse and inclusive workplace brings to the community. So please welcome Ben Eggleton. Thank you. Good morning. How's that going? How's that sound? Um, what a fabulous presentation from Peter. Um, it's uh, great to be here. I feel like I'm light entertainment building up to the, um, the main act, Michal Ipsen. Um, but seriously, I'm absolutely honoured to be here to speak on um, an incredibly important topic. So as um, Artie mentioned, um, I've in fact attended Clio um, since 1996. So that's um, half my life, except for the last two years. Um, and indeed, it's a great honour to speak on uh, such an important topic that is so timely, close to my heart, and a priority for this community. So in this presentation, I'm going to give some perspectives on the topic. And clearly, I come here as a middle-aged white guy from Australia, which some might say is ironic. I'm not a minority, as someone pointed out the other night. Um, and fair enough. Um, but as I will explain, and as Adi has alluded to, it's fair to say that I come here because of the proactive role that I have had and continue to have promoting diversity inclusion uh, within the Clio community and more generally. As I will explain, Clio was a conference that needed some help. Um, and with others who are here today, uh, we initiated efforts, um, including um, those that Artie alluded to, towards building a conference community that is more inclusive, that represents our diverse community and is therefore sustainable in the long term. So I come here with a global and Australian perspective. Uh, I note up front that Australia has a different history and different circumstances to the US context, but I note that I am speaking to a global audience. And as mentioned, I come here who, as someone who has been deeply involved in the Optical Society, Optica, IEEE Photonics, and Clio for more than 20 years, and as someone who lived in the US for seven years. I don't claim to be an expert. I'm not a scholar of innovation. Sorry, I'm not a scholar of diversity. Um, and I don't want to patronize this audience. And I don't claim to be always the exemplar of diversity and inclusion. As I will explain, we're all on a journey together, and it's never too late to start the journey. I'll present my own views and opinions informed by my own experience, by the people I've consulted with, many, and I'll acknowledge them at the end, representing what I believe is best practice and where stated by the literature. So thank you. Um, my goal is to explain the inherent value of building diversity and inclusion. Um, and at the outset, I want to state that my view is Obviously, and I think you all share the view that diversity and inclusion is an issue of human rights. It is common sense. It is critical that women, minorities more generally are treated equally. But what I want to highlight in this presentation is that it just happens that a byproduct of equity of treating all people as human beings is increased organisation value, innovation, performance and sustainability. So the outline of my presentation is as follows. I'll start really at the beginning and go through some basics, some nomenclature. Um, I'll talk about my own career journey. Um, I want to reflect uh, on the recent history. I make the point that, uh, in fact, we're in a much better position than we were five to ten years ago. I'll give uh, some really uh, interesting anecdotes and examples. Um, I'll briefly refer to the overwhelming uh, literature evidence um, that shows that, indeed, diversity and inclusion leads to more innovation, better 
um, productivity in organisations. Um, and I could speak, and others could speak for hours on the topic. I'm then going to introduce some of the tools um, that are available, and I know that this society is starting to use the tools uh, to improve our practice. And I'll make some recommendations. Um, why not um, be bold, given that I've travelled here from Australia, the only um, international plenary speaker I know, um, and conclude with some uh, perspectives on the next challenges. Next slide. So, inclusion, um, simply speaking, is diversity and engagement. Um, diversity is the what, inclusion is the how. Diversity focuses on the makeup of your organisation, your workforce, demographics such as gender, race, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, just to name a few. And inclusion is a measure of culture that enables diversity to thrive. And as I will explain, when we combine diversity and engagement, we have um, inclusion. And I love this simple analogy of the fruit salad. Looks like my breakfast at the Hilton Hotel this morning. Um, the concept, of course, is that inclusion is more than just putting um, a number of fruit on the table. The second basic point I want to make is that diversity is a complicated subject. Um, there is the diversity we see and there is the diversity we don't see. Um, visible diversity includes uh, gender, um, and even that is complicated race, skin colour, age. Um, but there are other attributes that are invisible, such as sexual orientation, cognitive disabilities and so forth. And we need to be well aware of this um, nuance and complexity. The third um, point before I launch um, is to refer to intersectionality. And I'll come back to intersectionality because it's an important concept. It refers to the ways in which different aspects of a person's identity can expose them to overlapping forms of discrimination and marginalisation. And I really regard intersectionality as uh, the frontier, although it's not a new topic, but it's a, a theme that we need to embrace as we move forward. So let me continue on with my um, own perspective. And as stated, I am anchored in this wonderful conference, the CLEO conference um, that I have attended since 1996 and was general chair in 2019, which um, was indeed a career highlight. I enjoyed the experience um, very much, working with wonderful leaders and professionals. Um, and you can see um, some photos standing. I guess we were upstairs uh, here in San Jose with about 4,000 people in the room um, introducing Nobel Prize winners. And um, it was just a, an extraordinary experience, a wonderful week. Um, I can recall when I um, started my involvement as CLEO chair. And as CLEO general chair, you serve as CLEO program chair two years earlier. So in 2017, I was program chair. And that meant in 2016, I was starting to um, sit in the committee meetings. And I remember sitting at the front of one of these large committee rooms upstairs, uh, at the front. Um, indeed, I was sitting next to Professor McCullipson and Professor Irina Novakova and others, looking out at this room and noting that there were 58 men, two women. And there was something wrong, um, which triggered me. Um, I can remember at that 2019 conference, um, attending a fabulous workshop. Some of you um, were at this workshop. We organised um, a series of focus workshops. Um, you might guess from the people in the photo who what the topic is. And I tweeted this uh, photo, as I do. And um, the wonderful thing about social media is that it keeps you honest. So immediately, <laughs> There were dozens and dozens of comments making the obvious uh, reflection on the lack of diversity. No criticism intended to the people who were attending. And in fact, it was a great workshop, really good workshop. And in fact, on the panel, we had pretty good diversity. But the photo uh, tells a story. And so fair enough, that response. Um, and it dawned on me, and I think others um, at the time, that there really was no coherent commitment to diversity and inclusion at Cleo. Um, 
we would ask about guidelines and there would often be, oh yes, of course, we've had guidelines, but nobody could find them. Um, <laughs> and look, this observation was no criticism of the CLIA organisers, of which I was a chair. Um, it's no criticism of Optica, I would say, or Ultra Polyphotonics. We all have shared ownership of this issue. I was not sufficiently proactive, um, but I have changed and we are changing. And so it was at that Clio, as Artie mentioned, um, that there was a serious push from the leadership of um, our community um, to make diversity and inclusion an explicit priority with a proactive approach. And indeed, we are seeing evidence uh, of that um, hard work at this conference with um, clear um, uh, evidence of diversity in a number of initiatives, including throughout the conference uh, workshops and panel discussions, as already mentioned. And we are seeing a significant change in progress uh, in the leadership of the Optical Board, uh, I should believe Photonics Board of Governors, the conference leaderships, uh, and so forth, and some really outstanding leadership from um, my colleagues uh, who represent uh, our society. So let me give a, a bit more perspective from my own experience uh, in Australia. Um, and I can be honest and say it wasn't so long ago that I attended my own workshops um, and was quite comfortable to um, chair all male panel sessions and not even be aware of gender balance, let alone other aspects of diversity. I can recall numerous advisory boards and other governance uh, leadership structures that I've been involved in that were literally all middle-aged white men. I can recall um, conversations with high-profile leaders of our community, asking them what they thought of this issue, and their response was to simply say that all that matters is excellence, implying that a discussion about diversity takes us away from excellence, or more subtly, that we must choose between a diverse workplace or the pursuit of excellence, and I'll return to this point. It was implicit that it was an insurmountable problem to pursue both, that that's not true. These are not um, examples from the 70s, the 80s or the 90s. These are all from the last five to 10 years. And let me be clear, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone here or painting myself as a paragon of virtue. Those are my wife's words. <laughs> On reflection, I see myself as someone who wasn't sufficiently proactive and by being inactive made myself part of the problem. And it's not as if we were actively working against diversity. Simply speaking, we were not I was not, the leadership was not thinking about this. We were not taking a proactive approach. We didn't have the tools. We didn't have the data. Uh, we didn't have the champions. I think we were just on autopilot, to be honest. Let me talk a little bit about my um, career, um, just to, to let you know a little bit about myself and where I form my views. So I think it's fair to say I had a typical trajectory of um, a researcher involved in the CLIO, a PhD at the University of Sydney, um, had uh, seven wonderful years in uh, Bell Labs, Murray Hill, working with um, some great um, mentors, um, had got married in New York City, two kids, and have been at the University of Sydney since 2003 in uh, different leadership roles, including uh, Centre Director for Kudos, which was the National Centre and more recently, as Artie mentioned, um, director of the University of Sydney Nano Institute, and I'll say a little bit more about Na Sydney Nano because I think we are uh, an exemplar at the University of Sydney for diversity. It's fair to say that um, my own leadership in diversity and inclusion has really been over the last 10 years, and since then I'd like to believe that I've been able to build diverse um, organisations and structures, creating uh, teams, um, that has enabled me to build um, programs that are examples where the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts and has placed us um, to address the grand challenges. And I was intrigued by um, Eric's uh, presentation um, talking about some of the grand challenges, global challenges. My current leadership role, uh, indeed as Director of Sydney Nano, which is a multidisciplinary initiative at the University of Sydney, um, that unites across the STEM discipline, science, engineering, health and medicine, and social sciences, requires me to build 
uh, diverse teams across disciplines um, to achieve, as I said, a whole that is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, in order to address some of those grand challenges that we face as a world. Um, and it is worth remembering um, the importance of science and uh, technology um, in addressing uh, some of those significant uh, challenges uh, such as sustainability, climate change, uh, infectious disease, water, national security, quantum computing, and all of those um, large-scale programs We've assembled uh, multidisciplinary, diverse, inclusive, empowered teams to um, achieve, again, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. This approach uh, translates into my other leadership roles, um, whether it's as editor-in-chief of APL Photonics, I'll just plug, <laughs> we had a lovely reception last night, um, but also my research uh, group. And I, I wanna just um, note my leadership team uh, Sydney Nano, uh, and again, I'd like to think an exemplar of diversity um, with um, a balance of uh, gender, ethnic diversity, um, and mid-career, early career um, colleagues that work with me to drive Sydney Nano's mission to transform the world. I want to also acknowledge some of the um, outstanding postdocs and students that I have um, mentored, I'm very proud of. Um, I put this slide in this morning. Morty Segev and I were chatting last night at the APL Photonics reception about Andrea, who was a postdoc in my group who um, was involved in a collaboration with Morty Segev at the Technion and um, is an outstanding scholar and um, is on an amazing trajectory. Very proud of Andrea. Uh, wish her all the best. And I also want to acknowledge Dr. Birgit Stiller, who I happened to catch up with last night, um, who is now um, a group leader at Max Planck Institute in Germany and uh, will be presenting the posted line, I guess, at this conference tonight or tomorrow night. And my own research group, as shown here, um, an interesting mixture of um, engineer scientists and designers um, with a a really interesting diversity um, that you could see in the photo. I want to go back to um, this discussion on excellence um, because that's, that's really key to understanding the issue. Um, of course it's about excellence, but excellence is in the eye of the beholder. It is subjective. Excellence must consider the opportunity. In the Australian context, um, we have the expression relative to opportunity um, in our grants. How do we determine what is best? When you know society has an unequal playing field and we know unconscious bias is well documented. Um, we know, for example, gender balance starts off well um, in early years but tapers off as careers progress, particularly in STEM disciplines. This is um, a plot I'm sure you've all seen before, it's um, specific to the natural and physical sciences, but I think you could comfortably generalize that to other STEM disciplines. And it highlights one of the challenges we have um, in our workforce um, and the gender balance, um, which again, is just one um, embodiment of diversity um, is not maintained as uh, people progress, women progress through their careers. How do we ensure that excellence is not simply determined by who is most visible, who is most out and about? The networks of the committee members making the decisions. Um, and how do we get to a point where the field is equal when we know that, as has been said many times, you can't be what you can't see. And if we have uh, an imbalance at the top, um, we have a, a problem with that pipeline. I think it's fair to say that my thinking in this area was in fact strongly influenced by my colleagues from the astronomy community, in Australia in particular. They were taking a very proactive approach well before the University of Sydney leadership, uh, well before the Australian Optical Society. And I think it's fair to say their efforts triggered a national conversation. Um, 
about 10 years ago that cascaded to the Australian Academy of Science, the Australian Optical Society, and eventually across the academic sector, corporate governance, uh, which I have been able to channel through my leadership roles and at the international stage. Back in 2010, I would regularly meet uh, with Professor Brian Gainsler, who was a director of an astronomy centre, who is now a professor at the University of Toronto, for lunch every month. And we would talk about our strategies. And I was learning from Brian uh, how they were approaching diversity uh, in a proactive way. And to, to be honest, I was initially cynical and it was uh, quite uh, eye-opening for me. So what motivated that community to take a proactive approach? Was it because they realised it was the right thing to do from a human rights perspective? Well, yes, but maybe it was also that they realised that a more inclusive and diverse organisation was going to create a more successful and sustainable community, a more innovative organisation that takes advantage of the full breadth of expertise available within society. Why is diversity good for science and innovation? Well, what the astronomy community realised, and I think we have subsequently embraced, and is now well documented, is that diverse and inclusive groups are more innovative and are better performers. Diversity is not just a fair thing, it's a case for more innovation. And there's plenty of evidence. Um, you literally just have to Google diversity builds innovation, or a combination of the words, and you'll find um, a lot of good literature, um, and just a snapshot. Um, and I'm not an authority. I'm not going to speak to you for half an hour with data. Um, it's out there. And here are some examples from Harvard Business Review, McKinsey's, um, that talk to the value of diversity and inclusion in organisations, both in terms of uh, revenue, uh, productivity, uh, growth, and so forth. Lots of data. Uh, this is a plot. Um, it's a scatter plot. It's hard to sort of unpack it. Bottom line is that it shows that there is a very strong correlation um, across organisations that have diverse workforce and productivity. Um, the evidence is compelling. Um, last night, I received an email from a colleague who said that the um, latest report from the um, ASX, which is our um, equivalent of stock exchange, had just been um, published. Uh, and as part of that is the Board Diversity Index. So the corporate world has embraced the data, the transparency around diversity uh, in organisations on boards. Um, and you can read that, I can't read that. But um, the obvious um, observations are, are there. To, to, to really motivate um, the corporate world and more generally that diversity builds innovation, builds productivity. Uh, so I do encourage you to, to Google uh, this um, and um, understand this uh, more deeply. Let me give some more specific um, examples from Australia. And as I mentioned, um, I invested a bit of time in this presentation. I wanted to give a perspective that um, was authentic, informed by uh, best practice. And I did consult with uh, many, many people. Some of you are, he are here today. I want to give some examples from Australia. That's is where I'm based. So it does give a particular, uh, I'm looking through a particular lens. Celine Bohm is uh, the head of school of physics and is a minority and is an example of someone who falls into the intersectionality category. Um, a fine leader, a fine colleague of mine, I happen to also sit in the School of Physics as an academic. And as head of school, she set out to um, improve the gender balance. So I asked Celine, well, what was your approach? Did you focus on excellence? And she said, of course I did. Why would you ask something? What else is there? But of course, she talked about excellence relative to opportunity. And she made the point that, indeed, you have to work harder to get a pool of candidates that is representative of the community. Um, but um, she has taken the school uh, forward and uh, is an exemplar of leadership. 
Two other examples, inspiring leaders. I uh, encourage you to follow them on Twitter. If you're not, if you are on Twitter, if you're not, you should get on Twitter. Uh, Professor Dame Athene Donald um, in the UK, professor at Cambridge, thought leader, influencer, um, who has had um, huge impact on uh, gender diversity issues in the UK and more broadly. And she says, uh, in science research, as in just about every other sphere, the playing field has a significant tilt to it, which we are only slowly beginning to rebalance. Work to do, not just on International Women's Day, but on every day of the year. Professor Emma Johnson, um, soon to be my boss, um, has been the Dean of Science at the University of New South Wales and will be the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research at the University of Sydney um, in July. Emma says, um, Successful approach to promoting gender equi equity is to view it as a team sport, not an arduous individual quest, although it sometimes feels like that, doesn't it? That each of us must undertake on our own. It's easy to wash your hands of responsibility for promoting diversity if you view it through the lens of what I can do. I'm just one person, but it's much easier to achieve genuine progress if we all chip in a little bit. And the other example is someone who will be familiar to this community, Professor Tanya Munro. Tanya uh, was a PhD student at the University of Sydney. Tanya's only two years behind me. I feel like Tanya is 20 years ahead of me. Um, Tanya had a very distinguished scientific career at the University of Southampton, returned to Australia in 2005, um, Federation Fellow of the Academy of Science, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, and is now Australia's Chief Defence Scientist. So that's the highest bureaucrat in the country with a budget of... Um, $600 million, and Tanya has, and is a champion of diversity, as indicated. And I can see the clock, I've got three minutes, so let me move through. Um, my last point is really to talk about the tools, and just to make the point that there are an extraordinary number of tools that are available, and I'm pleased that um, Optica, IEEE Photonics are starting to use the tools. I want to go back to the astronomy community, because as I mentioned in my own experience, they were the um, trailblazers. And this is a, a snapshot from the Castro website. Um, Professor Brian Gainsler and Kate Gunn, who was the Chief Operations Officer, I'm in contact with both of them. And it's a lovely website. All of the information is there. So that if, like I was, struggling with how to take an active role, how do I contribute, how do I help, what are the tools? They are there. And I think we need to make sure that the tools um, are available. Um, an article from Professor Jenny Martin, who's now Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research at the University of Wollongong. Some basic rules for how to run a conference. Collect the data. Where's the data? Have a speaker policy. I think Clio is pretty good. Make that policy visible. Have committees that are balanced and informed, sensible. Report the data. Um, respond to resistance. Support women, and maybe support women and minorities at meetings. Be family friendly. Take the pledge. What's the pledge? Well, the panel pledge is an Australian concept. I think it's an Australian concept that um, asks leaders to sign up to a pledge that says, I'm going to be a visible champion for diversity. In this case, emphasising gender, but I think more generally for diversity. It says that I will be outspoken on diversity in any public forum. I will only attend a conference if I'm convinced that they take diversity seriously. I will not speak at a conference as a plenary if I feel that the representation is not um, diverse. Um, champions of change. Uh, another concept that I think um, says that we need champions, and the champions don't need to be the minorities. Um, in fact, in Australia, the champions of change typically are the middle-aged white men, um, and I think that um, is, is healthy. There are a number of organisations that um, give accreditation to organisations. Athena Swan, uh, SAGE, um, Universities um, sign up to achieve a certain sort of uber rating, if you like, to demonstrate their commitment to diversity and inclusivity. 
Um, and this is a currency that matters, um, and I wonder if the professional societies have something similar. And finally, just to make the point that um, the good news is that Clio has come a long way, um, and I'm very proud to work with Adi Agarwal and Tara uh, Fortier and others on this um, very important cause, and uh, indeed there are targets. I'm quite comfortable with targets, as one of my colleagues said. Sometimes you need a sledgehammer, sometimes you need a needle, and in the case of Clio, uh, we needed a sledgehammer. So let me just um, wrap up with a few concluding remarks. On the one hand, things are improving. Um, it wouldn't surprise you that COVID has had a pretty significant impact on productivity and probably has exacerbated the problem. And we're going to see this play out over the next couple of years. So the last point I want to end on um, is just going back to the concept of intersectionality. Um, which is important to recognise and to understand um, that this is a concept introduced by Kimberly Crenshaw, a scholar, um, and as mentioned, um, it is a simple concept. It says that actually diversity is more nuanced than um, LGBTQI, ethnicity, gender, disabilities. There are people who fall into multiple categories. And so, um, eyes wide open, please. So final remarks. Um, I would like to advocate that going forward, inclusivity, diversity is more explicitly part of our values and culture. For example, to be an IEEE fellow, to be an Optica fellow. I advocate that you need to demonstrate your commitment to diversity, uh, to represent as you are as a fellow um, the society. Clio is the flagship um, event for our society. It's the home of science and innovation for photonics where we come together. This is where we need to shine. Um, the evidence is compelling. The tools are available. Let's get on with it. Um, and my final slide, I just want to acknowledge um, the tremendous uh, people I spoke to uh, who have helped uh, me synthesise the narrative that I presented this morning. Thanks very much and I look forward to talking to you over the, the next few days. Cheers.